ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد a number of ikhwah have mentioned that there's a matter going on particularly uh, here in the south or in certain areas of the south uh, which is the matter of this spreading of an idea which is that we only take from the Quran and we don't take from the sunnah and this is spreading though I mean obviously if any Muslim heard this they would reject the idea outright but it's coming in ways that are that are hidden or that are subtle or implicit and not explicitly being stated and people are being affected by this so a number of people have complained and have brought this up so the point is to know what are the shubhat what are the misconceptions that are used to make up this lie and how to respond to them and to show the flimsiness of this argument and the ridiculousness of it so the first thing that you might hear people saying is they'll say well we don't accept this because it's not in the Quran about anything so they won't come right they won't come out right and say i only take from the Quran or i don't accept the sunnah of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam no because this is too obvious no muslim who hasn't had these misconceptions drilled into their head would accept this so they'll say things and this is the particular example that was brought up is the prophet Isa alayhi salatu wassalam we don't we don't accept that he'll return before the hour why because it's not in the quran so why would we accept this if it's not in the quran and then they'll say things so this is where this is the first way that they try to get this idea in and then when you question them about the sunnah they'll say well you know the Quran was written down in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Sunnah wasn't written down until three, four, five hundred years after, so there's a big difference. And Allah subhanahu wa taala said in the Quran about the Quran that it's tabiyan al kulli shay. It's a clarification for every matter. And Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, told us ma farrakna fil kitab min shay, and they'll bring whatever they try to bring. And they make it look like, look how intellectual we are. We're professors, we're intellectuals, we're thinkers, we're philosophers. So we know what we're talking about. And they'll say things even worse than this. They'll say, where does it say in the Quran to take a hadith? They'll say, the Prophet Allah SWT said, obey the messenger. Well, he's not here. We can't. He doesn't tell us directly to do things, so we're not we're not doing anything wrong. Look how look how smart they are. They think you know. Look, we're 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 intellectuals. We can break down matters and have a normal conversation with people. And wallahi, this isn't the matter. This isn't the issue. Wallahi, they're not intellectuals. And wallahi, they're closer to being humor and donkeys than they are of being anyone with any intellect, let alone an actual intellectual. Why? Because each argument is flimsy in and of itself and shows that it's almost grasping at straws. It's like someone who is drowning and they'll grab anything in front of them, whether it's a piece of grass, whether it's a weed, 
whether it's something floating in the water that's going to sink with them, they'll grab onto whatever they can because they're dying. They have nothing. So first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, He told us to obey the Messenger. No one doubts this. No one can doubt it. It's numerous times in the Quran. So what do we say when they say, well, He's not around, what are we going to do? First of all, just logically, if you tell one of your children, go tell your brother to do this. Do whatever. Clean up his room, take the garbage out, and then later on you see the room is still filthy, and you tell your, your other child, the one who was supposed to do it, didn't I tell you to clean your room? Imagine, just imagine the, the, the rage that would go through your body if, you, if your child responded, Oh, but he didn't tell me, you told him to tell me. So really, I mean, I don't have to obey him, I have to obey you. Your mind would, your, would be blown. So why is it any different this way? Someone passing on a command from somebody, it's still a command from the original person. Just like the Qur'an. Where do we get the Qur'an from? The Prophet ﷺ, where did he get the Qur'an from? Jibreel. Where did Jibreel get the Qur'an from? Allah. Do we then say, well, you know, it's in the Quran, I didn't hear Allah directly, so I don't have to do it? No, of course not. So what's the difference between this? Nothing. It's the exact same thing, but it just shows how they'll throw these things out and then kind of book it out of there to hope no one thought about it. Instead of someone say, we're going to sit and we're going to, we're going to discuss this and we're going to, you know, get to the bottom of it, because it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't last more than two seconds. So this is the first thing. Secondly, what do we say about this? When the Sahaba عنهم, the Prophet ﷺ would command them things directly, either in a khutbah, or in a, in a, in a gathering, or one-on-one, -on -one, he would tell them stuff. So obviously, by the Qur'an, we know that this is part of the deen. For that person to then listen to the Prophet ﷺ, this is part of the deen now, because Allah ﷻ said to obey the messenger. So, either the thing that this person was commanded with is part of the deen or it's not part of the deen. If we say it's not part of the deen, we've rejected the Qur'an. So according to these people, because we're saying, well no, you don't have to follow the Prophet, even those who heard it directly. And if we say it is from the deen, then we're left with two options. Either the deen is the same for the Sahaba and those after, or there's one deen for the Sahaba and one deen for those after. And if we say it's only for the Sahaba, then I don't know what's left to say to a person like that. If you say, well, the Sahaba had one deen of Islam, and every generation after had a, literally a completely different deen, what are you going to say to a person like that? They, they know they don't believe that. It's ridiculous. Or they say, no, the deen is always the same, and then the whole argument is done. That's the first thing, when they try to use that argument. Second, when they say things like, and they say it often sarcastically, or they attempt to be condescending, they'll say, oh, but you know, how can you accept something that was written three, four hundred years after the Prophet of his death? What are you doing? You know, what's, how is that comparable to the Quran that was written down in his lifetime? So first of all, they always try to, they attack, especially Sahih al-Bukhari, because it's the most, the most authentic book of a hadith. So they'll say, well, he died how many years after? And they always, for some, I don't know why, they always they have this 400 years. It's quite common, I don't know why. So first thing we say, well, no, al-Bukhari didn't die 400, or he wasn't written 400 years after the death of the Prophet Al-Bukhari himself died what year? 256, Hijri. So that's what? He died 246 years after the Prophet sent them. So already the math is off. It shows how either they literally don't know what they're doing, which then it's laughable, or they know and they're trying to exaggerate things, which shows that they're dishonest. Second, Al-Bukhari, did he write uh, his Sahih on his deathbed? No, he wrote it in his lifetime. So already that brings things down a little bit further, closer to the death of the Prophet sent them. Then, Al-Bukhari, he wasn't the first muhaddith. There were generations of muhaddithin before him. One of his teachers was uh, 
Imam Ahmed, who was before. Who was Imam Ahmed's teacher? One of his teachers, Imam al-Shafi'i. He wrote down a hadith as well. So now we're two generations further, closer. Who was Imam al-Shafi'i's teacher? Imam Malik. Imam Malik was two generations after the Prophet He already had a book, and for those who know about the science of a hadith, Imam Malik's time, he was in, so he was a student of a student of the Sahaba. So two generations after. By the time of Imam Malik's time, they weren't collecting a hadith, merely collecting. No, this is the level or the, the era in the, the science of a hadith that was, uh, that's labeled or uh, talked about as being not the gathering era, but the tasfiyah. They would go through and they would look at all, everything that was gathered from the generations before and look at what was authentic and what wasn't. So already, they were to the point where things were collected already. They were judging what is acceptable based upon the criteria set out by the ulama of hadith and what wasn't acceptable. So already in his time, and that's only two generations after the Prophet And on top of that, we know that the Sahaba wrote down a hadith in the time of the Prophet Why? Because they said that they, they would fear that they would forget things. So again, it's the same thing. So going from this this condescending attitude of, oh, well, you're accepting something 400 years after the Prophet's death, down to everything about that statement is a lie. It's a little bit different. And it's not, again, it's not, it's not just wrong that, oh, the information was wrong. It was either it's just an outright lie, or these people, they, they, can't, they can't think. They can't conceptualize matters and judge them in a good way. Also, they'll say, who are these people in chains of narration? What is this chains of narration? Where do you know if this person is uh, authentic, or if he's an acceptable narrator, or if he's not an acceptable narrator? And we have to check all these things, and, and, and who, where, what is this? How did the Qur'an come to us? Anyone who studied Qur'an formally knows, right down till today, there's chains of narration to the Qur'an. So and so read the Quran on his shaykh. He read it on his shaykh. He read it all the way back to the Tabi'een, back to the Sahaba, back to the Prophet. So when we say we verify the Quran, we know the Quran is the Quran we have now is the same Quran that the Prophet had. It's not because someone picks up the Mus'haf and says, Yeah, it looks the same as the one I found in Calvary. It must be the same. No. Because you can go, you can pick up a Mus'haf, and you can go to the scholars who preserve this. And you can recite it on them. And if you change something, they're going to know. And there's not just one guy in the world who knows. No, there's thousands. This is a ni'mah, and this is a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this ummah. This is the, the blessing of the asnad, the blessing of a chain. So the same thing that you, you complain about, about the ahadith, the Quran came to us the same way. It's not because the, the mutba'ah in uh, Medina or the Publishing House of Medina published it this way, the same way as they published it in Tanzania, so it's, we know it's the... No, it's not like that at all. It's the exact same thing with the hadith. And furthermore, there's still chains of narration back in the Prophet Sallallahu for his hadith. So and so heard it from so and so, so and so. Back to the Prophet Sallallahu For the books of a hadith and for the individual a hadith. Students of knowledge and Scholars can trace their chain directly back to the Prophet ﷺ. So how about if it was only four or five, sometimes two generations after the Prophet ﷺ? It shows how it's just openly trying to spread facade and trying to reject things from the deen. And inshallah we'll talk about a few more of these misconceptions after the sitting. Wallahu <coughs> والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. Another thing, and this is usually the the most basic thing that any أخ or any أخ who's on the fitra still or hasn't had their their being changed for them knows how to bring up this argument against these people. So they'll say, okay, you come to the masjid and pray with us and you, you, know, you pray at home and so on. How do you know how to pray? And they'll say, well, the Quran gives us the general, you know, the general rules, 
And then we learn from our scholars. So then we say, okay, well you learned from your teacher. Where did he get it from? Did he just make it up? If they say well, he just made it up, well then, what are you going to say? If someone thinks just any random person can make up something, and now that's, that's how you do the Salat now, there's no discussing with them. If they say, no, he learned it from his teacher. So okay, that's good. Where did he learn it from? Then we go back again. Did he make it up? If so, we go down. It's like a flow chart. This is how you argue. If they say he got it from his teacher, we say, okay, that's good. All the way back to the Prophet So now, what's the difference? They're taking their deen from a chain, and we're taking our deen from chains. The difference is, our chains are, there's a consensus on them. This is how we take it. Their chains is just some, I heard it from someone, I don't know who, he was in the masjid one time, he taught me how to pray. I'm guessing he heard it from someone in the masjid. He probably heard it from someone in, a, in another masjid, and so on, so on, so on. It's just, it's a bunch of guesswork. It's conjecture. Compared to Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali and Abu Hurair and Aisha, the, the, the height of humanity after the prophets, to their students, who were the height of humanity after the Sahaba, and we have textual evidence for this, down, 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 until it was written down in a finite number of people who we know where they were born, where they died, where they traveled, how old they were, who they met, who didn't they meet, how many hadith they made mistakes in, and so on. As opposed to, yes, yeah, some guy told me. Now he probably heard it from someone. That's my deen now. And the problem is though, because of what I mentioned in the beginning, that they try to sound intellectual, is a lot of people are falling for it. A lot of them are, yeah, this kind of sounds kind of right. So the, 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 the point of the khutbah, on top of mentioning their, their, you know, their misconceptions and how to refute them, is if you see these things, if you know how to refute them, inshallah, go ahead, and inshallah, you're rewarded for it, and you'll be rewarded for trying to defend the deen, and every person that you stop from falling into that misconception, inshallah, you'll receive rewards for them, following the truth. But if you don't know, and this is the more dangerous area, if you don't know, don't have these discussions. Why? Because in general, if you know it's wrong in general, then there's no need to have to go and find out what they have to say. Refer it to somebody who knows. Tell them, you know what? I don't know what you're talking about, it doesn't make any sense to me. Go talk to so-and-so, he knows what he's saying. Or, go find someone the Imam of a Masjid, or a student of knowledge, or just someone who has dealt with this type of thing before, and say, Afi, we're having this problem, please come and you know, give us a hand because it's going to make a lot of fitna. And deal with it that way. And someone might say, well, what's the problem of hearing, you know, we're all affected by the idea of freedom of speech and, and different ideas and stuff like this. The problem is, this is a shubha, it's a misconception that might lead you out of your deen. It's not, you know, I like this kind of food and he likes this kind of food and everybody has their own opinion, or I think this is the best car and that's the best car and whatever. No, this is a matter of your deen. It's a matter of where you're going to abide eternally after you die. It's not a light matter. And to end, there's another reason, and someone might say, well, you're, you're blowing it out of proportion. Imam al-Suyuti, rahimahullah, who was, uh, you know, he was one of the much later scholars in the 900s, mentioned that there's a consensus. So at least up until his time, no scholar disagreed, every scholar agreed that if you don't accept the sunnah, so what these people are doing, that you're a Catholic, you're not a Muslim. Why? Because you're rejecting the wife. It's the same as rejecting the Qur'an except it's the other half or the other part of the wahi. So we don't deal with this as a matter of, you know, this person believes the khutbah can be in different languages and this person believes the khutbah can only can be in Arabi, or I think you raise your hands after you get up from rapport and the other person says, no, you don't. No, that's one issue. This is a completely different issue. 
So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the Muslims in this city and elsewhere from this shubha. I ask Allah ta'ala and yawfir al mu'minin wa al-mu'minat wa an yawfir al-muslimin fi kulli makan. Allahumma shri maradana wa maradha al-muslimin wa atam as-salat.